This is the first time that we have had a mountain bike session, so I am very excited about this because I have worked for LIB since 2006. I've been a part of Cambridge for probably much longer, and I actually got into bicycling first as a mountain bike bicyclist, then road cycling, then commuting. So I, I was very pleased when Ed asked me to organize this session. So we do have um, three wonderful speakers today. If we do have time at the end, I will be speaking a little bit about both uh, women in mountain biking, getting them more involved, as well as kids. If we do not have time, because like I said, we have three great speakers lined up, then just know that I am a, a resource for that, as are they. Also, so I do not forget, we do have some Share the Trail posters and brochures. I have some here. And we do also have some in the main room at uh, LIB's table. So as I said, the session today is on mountain biking in Illinois. And then if I can, uh, we wanted to get a short thing. How many of you are here as a mountain biker? So small group. How many of you are here from a bicycling group? And how many of you are here for your uh, town or agency? Wonderful. Well, that is very good to know. So we are going to have uh, Jerry Staggy. Staggy. So you think after all these years I would know how to pronounce his name. <laughs> he is the current executive director of the Chicago Area Mountain Bikers. He will be speaking first today, and that will be followed by Tim McGrath from the Peoria Area Mountain Biking Association, or PAMBA, and then Drew Hagen with the Kickapoo Mountain Biking Club. And Jerry, sorry, I do have his... is an avid cycl cyclist and has toured throughout both the Midwest as well as the Northeastern United States. He's been mountain biking since 91, and he has been executive director of Camber for the past five years. Mm -hmm. He has traveled throughout the U.S. to experience different mountain bike trails. He has, uh, besides being the executive director of Camber, he's also been a National Mountain Bike Patrol instructor and charter member of the World Mountain Bike Congress. Currently, he is serving on the planning committees of the Forest Preserves of Cook County, as well as the Big Marsh Project. Thank you. The uh, we'll talk today a little bit about multi-use trails and how they're actually a recreational resource. And it's good that there's a lot of people here from um, from agencies and land managers. Because when you start off thinking about what you use as a recreational resource, the first thing that really comes to mind for most people is something that falls into this category. You, know, you look at baseball diamonds, or swimming pools, you have football fields, uh, you have soccer fields, lacrosse, uh, golf courses, and then you have boat launches and fishing facilities. 
Sports really are evolving. They're a lot different. Uh, when I grew up, you basically, in fall, you played football. In winter, you played basketball or hockey. In spring, there was track. And then in summer, it was baseball. And the other day, I was at a, one of my son, my son was playing rugby. So I was watching his rugby game. And on the, um, behind the field, which was also a football field, on the field behind him, which was another football field, but was now set up for soccer, was a girls' soccer team. And just off to the, the side was a lacrosse team playing. So there were three sports happening at one time at this high school that didn't even exist back when I was growing up. So the, the sporting, what kids are looking for for sports today is really expanded from what um, they were looking for back when we were all growing up. And if you look at everything that's up here, it gives you a big, gives you a big idea of how diverse all the user groups it could be. But one thing that all the user groups use are trails. No matter how diverse it gets, no matter what needs you're serving, one need that gets covered with everything are trails. And there's really three types of trails. And each of them have a little bit of different cost and a little bit different economic impact. If you look up at the top there, i got two screens but one pointer. But if you look at the top corner, you have people cycling down a crushed gravel trail. And then you have a family walking between venues at a park on another type of a trail. You have dog people walking their dog and hiking along. Sort of a, kind of a cross between a crushed gravel trail, developed trail, and natural surface trail. And you have a, I used to say it's an older couple, but they're going to be my contemporaries. They don't look as old as they used to. <laughs> uh, you know, holding hands, walking down there. And then you have a, you know, gravel path that is really, it, it took some effort to build, but it doesn't have a big bed and foundation beneath it. Sort of an undeveloped gravel type path along a trail here. But the one trail that isn't showing up here is something that I think everybody has. If you manage any type of land at all, and you have any amount of woods, you have what's called natural surface trails. You may not legally have them on your maps. You may not um, have built them. You may not even approve of them. But I guarantee you, all of your woods have them. Everybody, if there's woods and there's a place to walk or a place to ride your bike, there's people using it. So. There's a demand for this type of trail. So the question begins then is, if we have a demand and we know people are going to use it, how do we manage it? How do we control it? How do we price it? How do we build it? I mean, how do we budget? How do we do all these different things to give people what they're looking for and yet be able to maintain the environment that's really important to all these different wooded areas? And natural surface trails can be made to do that. <coughs> If you look at who uses a natural surface trail, the, uh, whoops. If you look up there, there's equestrians and there's mountain bikers following up the hill. That, I'm sure, will change once they reach the top. And the, uh, there's the uh, trail runners. Trail runners are huge. I mean, five years ago, the only people that ran on trails five, six years ago were really high school cross country teams. But if you go to any large trail system today, there's hundreds of trails runners out every day, if not thousands, if you live in a big metropolitan area. Uh, it, the Palos Trail System in Chicago was ranked by one Runner's World as one of the top 20 trails, running trail systems in America. And there are parking lots full of runners there every day. Uh, and weekends it's packed. So trail running is something you didn't even used to think about, but they love natural surface trails. They use them all the time. You have, oops, you have kids. I get used to this. You have kids that hike on those trails. You've got just regular hikers in general. You've got guys just out exploring. And then, of course, you have mountain bikers on these trails. So there's a lot of different people that can use the same facility, just like the same people can use a football field, a lacrosse field, and a soccer field. Natural surface trails service a lot of different user groups that aren't just user-specific, they're really multi-user <coughs> facilities. And if you start looking at these facilities, you start looking at these trails, one of the questions that always comes to mind is, you know, how much damage does it cause? What's the environmental impact? You know, we have these trails on our property right now that these, we've been there for 20 years, let's say, and that's not even an exaggeration, someone have been there 50 years. And they're all rutted out and the water's, you know, eroded the channel down and they're causing damage. That absolutely is true and that happens. It happens because those trails weren't properly built. If you look at the Appalachian Trail, which is built almost exactly to the standards proposed by the International Mountain Biking Association, the Appalachian Trail has been around since the 30s. It's maintained mostly by volunteers, some by the Park Service. And that trail is very sustainable through all types of weather and used all year round. So there are ways to build natural surface trails 
that will allow them, yeah, when, granted when the frost comes out of the ground, yeah, you're going to have to close the trails until the trails get a chance to harden. But once they do, they're going to be very solid all year round. The water won't erode, it won't run off. So the ability to have a, a sustainable trail that's, um, that is a natural 